Well, good morning and welcome into worship. We're delighted to have you here at Forest Park Church with us today. It is an honor to be watching online. We're delighted to have you however you have found us today. If you're watching online and you would like a copy of our bulletin, a couple of ways that you can get that uh, are both located in the uh, Facebook feed that you're watching. Click on either of those hot links that you see there. They will take you to uh, a place where you can grab a hold of our bulletin, print it out for yourself, or just look at it online as we're moving through the service today. If you are watching online, while you cannot fill out one of our connection cards, we do want to know that you're with us. Please be sure to give us a thumbs up. Uh, say hello to us in the comments. Let us know where you're watching from. It's an honor to have you uh, equally. If you are here in the sanctuary this morning, please be sure that uh, you comes around. Or if you're a first-time guest with us this morning, be sure you hang on to that and drop it by our information desk in the gathering area as you exit. We have a gift that we would love to share with you and all first-time visitors today. Uh, our uh, deepest sympathy are extended to Mike, Mary, and Jonathan Elbert on the passing of Mike's mom, uh, Jean Burns, out in Texas. Uh, Mike, Mary, and family are out there. Uh, we continue to lift them up and pray for a number of other announcements that are listed in your bulletin today. Uh, our Wednesday night dinner that you need to sign up for this week, if you would like to join us, is pork loin and Cajun potatoes. Please be sure you sign up by Tuesday at noon. Uh, I think Mary Ann said we have two Boston butts left. Is that only one Boston butt left? So if you've got big plans over the Labor Day weekend, why not pick up that last Boston butt so that you can at least not have to. This morning we wanted to take just a few moments and uh, hear from uh, Penny Beitzel. Penny's going to come and talk to us now about uh, what it means to her to be part of the women's ministry and what it is that she has enjoyed most about women's retreats of the past. Penny uh, and her husband Tom are regular attenders of our late service and uh, Penny is very knowledgeable about things church. What a blessing, what a blessing. She's kind of a small of all trades, and she pretty much masters everything she tries. So uh, how's that for a build-up? All right. Well, you know, that's why you have coffee, right? Come talk to us, Penny. Thank you. Good morning, guys. Good morning. There we go. All right. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I want to tell you about my experience with Fall Retreat last year. To begin with, I want to start with, um, I was really not in a good place last fall. I've been a Christian since I was in college. Not feeling very stuck. I was just stuck in this place. Can't move forward. Can't move backward in my faith. Really, since the hurricane kind of set me off. Then COVID. I just felt stuck in the faith journey. And I was just so tired of mediocrity. I couldn't take it anymore. I was also feeling very broken inside. I'm pretty sure some of you felt like this before, at least some point in your life. Things in my little world had turned upside down in a short period of time, which led to that feeling. Well, you know, life happens. It adds up to just too much sometimes. This was a perfect description of me last fall. But still, I kept praying. I kept coming to church. I kept going to my Bible study. Luckily, Amanda Kaufman kept remind, reminding me that God hears me, even though I wasn't so sure sometimes, which he did, because then he sent Marianne Walker to ask me to come to the fall retreat. But because I was felt stuck, broken inside, I didn't feel very social or strong in my faith at that point in time, so I didn't really want to go. God and I had several heated discussions about this. Maybe you've had similar conversations with God, I don't know. Finally, I thought, okay, well, maybe this is a chance for me and God to hang out at the top of the mountain. So I did agree to go, but only after I played the little game of, I'll go if you go, with my friend Kathy Bauer. You guys ever played that game before? Um, our middle-aged insecurities were in high gear about spending time with a bunch of women that we didn't really know in a place far away. So uh, we, um, my point here is to tell you that... Um, God puts people in your life to tell you where he needs to be so that you can hear from him. 
many years ago, God gave a vision to a woman in this church, Sheila Ray, uh, to create a weekend retreat where women could draw closer, closer to God, closer to each other, to quiet their souls, strengthen their relationships with each other. The word retreat actually means step back. Step back from your life, step back from your job, step back from your responsibilities. Not forever, just for a weekend. We know that Jesus retreated so many times to pray, refocus, left whatever he was doing to make it a priority. I can see now why. Because what I actually found when I got to retreat on top of this mountain was that it was a place for not only for me and God to hang out, but it was also a chance for me, myself, and I to hang out too, without any distractions. You see, God wants us to come. He wants us to be still, even when we're too busy, even when we don't feel like going. It was during this retreat that God was finally able to reach me, but only because I was able to still my mind and heart. He did this through the speakers. He did this through their messages. He did this through their worship music that was there. He did this through prayer. One of the women there prayed with me. Some of you might know her, Martha Lowe. She goes to the later service. Um, inside the most peaceful prayer room I had ever been in that Mary Ann had envisioned so many months before. God and I had some serious discussions about going in that prayer room with Martha too, trust me. Um, I tell you all this to let you know that it was in this beautiful, quiet mountainside place, surrounded by 60 women who loved me unconditionally, that God was finally able to fix all those tiny little broken pieces, put them back together again. Those women reminded me of God's promises to me and helped set me back on track. All of a sudden, I wasn't stuck anymore. My faith has grown stronger, and I'm able to do more work to honor him. Although I feel like I've kind of come out of my cave and gone on the interstate, but okay. Um, none, of me, none of this would have happened if I hadn't have gone to the retreat. So I'm here to invite you to, maybe you're stuck like I was. Maybe you're feeling a little bit broken inside. Maybe you're so busy that you can't hear God among all the things that you have to do. Maybe you need the love and laughter of some other women in your life. I invite you to retreat, step back, let God do his work in you, just like he did in me. Listen to those people who are encouraging you to go. There's a reason you're supposed to be there, even if you don't know what it is yet. You see, God is already weaving those plans, his plans, to reach you that weekend, too. The retreat was placed for God to show me who he was. The retreat was a place for God to show me who I am. The retreat was a place for God to show me what he could really do. More importantly, so that I could come back down that mountain with my purpose renewed, unstuck, unbroken, ready to go forward. So I hope you guys are going to join me this year because after seeing all the pictures on Facebook yesterday that Marianne posted from their trip up there, I'm even more excited to go this year. So I want to ask, are there any women in this congregation who has been to a fall retreat before? Just one? Okay, could y'all stand up a little bit? You guys stand up. Come on now, stand up. Miriam's already standing. All right, so now, these are the women in your congregation that you can go and talk to and ask them more about it. They're here, they'll be glad to share probably a similar story. Thank you, ladies. And men, you know your ladies more than anybody. If you think they need a retreat, encourage them to go. Tell them that you will take care of the finances and that you will take care of the household, even though it might be spouse appreciation weekend. But tell them that it's okay for them to go and that you want them to go. So that's really all I have to say today. I want you to come. I'm excited about it. And if you want more of my story, I'll be glad to share it with you. And I'm pretty sure I'm way out of time. No, you're fine. Thank you, Penny. I appreciate you sharing.
One of the many ways that we are uh, doing our best to be intentional about connecting with you and more importantly connecting you with God in an environment that is inviting to you, but in an environment that uh, is very intentional about allowing us all to experience God in a way that is two-way. That's the way our relationship works with God. God talks to us, we talk to God, He moves us, we do His work here on this earth. And coming together with people of like mind and like heart is something that we always need to seek to do because iron sharpens iron. It is in the midst of other disciples that we grow the most. And Fall Women's Retreat is a beautiful time for you to be able to experience that. Thank you to Penny. Thank you for Mary Ann. Uh, Mary Ann, am I forgetting anything? Are we good there? Very good. Registration forms just outside this door. Hang a hard left, and you'll see Mary Ann's office. You can register right there. Let's take time this morning to pray, and then we move into worship together. Bow with me as we pray. God, we thank you that when we seek you, you will be found. We thank you that in your presence, we find renewal, we find revival. And we are able to experience you in so many different ways. And just like Penny spoke about, there are times when we are in need, when we simply can't. You, Father, bridge that gap. We praise you that you are the one true living God who is in our midst now and makes that happen for us. We thank you for your son. And as we come together today to celebrate with each other, to worship you, it's our prayer that you inhabit our worship, that you inhabit our praise, and that you send revival to our souls, that we might indeed move out of this place, move into the world, and be the church for a world that is dying for the church and doesn't even know it. Help us to be your hands and your feet in this place. Amen. stand and sing Come Thou Fount. Let us continue with our worship now as we join our hearts together along with our voices and recite our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Brother Michael is going to come and share with us a reading from the Old Testament this morning. And as he is on his way up here, thank you to Cheryl for leading us this morning and playing in, uh, in uh, Chris's absence. Uh, what a blessing it is to have you. Michael. Thank you, Pastor. Good morning, sir. Good morning. verses we're reading from the New International Version. It reads thusly, strengthen the feeble hand, steady the knees that give way, say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, your God will come, he will come with vengeance, with divine retribution he will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be open and the ears of the deaf, deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool. The thirsty ground bubbling springs in the haunts where jackals once lay. Grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. May the Lord give understanding to his word. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Michael. On the heels of that beautiful reading, let's take time to uh, go together uh, to, mm, how about this? How about if we take time to bow our heads and hearts and go to the Lord in prayer? Bow with me. God, what beautiful words from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah reminds us of the depth and truth of your love for us and exactly who you are looking into the future drawing from the past and dealing with the presence Isaiah expounds upon the truth of a living God who walks the earth with his creation you are that God we lift you up and praise you today. You are the one who can bring about change. You are the one who can bring about healing. You are the one who brings hope into a hopeless world. Yes. Through your son, Jesus Christ, you have brought for us an example of what it means to live a life of sacrifice. And not only an example, but also a sacrifice. For he himself moved from servant to sacrifice he died our death for us he shed his blood in our stead and because of that wonderful sacrifice because of that ultimate act of servanthood we know peace with you restoration hope forgiveness let us never forget these things that have been spoken about from the beginning of time to now it is the truth of a God who truly loves, the truth of a God who truly desires relationship, the truth of a God 
who would stand in the gap for his creation that we might be redeemed. We worship you. We honor and praise you today, Heavenly Father. As we bear our hearts before you today, we do so not only on our behalf, but on behalf of others. For those who are sick, for those who are hurting, for those who are ailing in body and mind, for those marginalized, for those depressed, for those suffering at the hands of social injustice, we offer our prayers. And better, or at least equal to our prayers, we offer ourselves in service to those who need a fresh outpouring of your physical presence. Help us remember, Father, that's our call, to minister in your name. Send us forth to do this. We pray, Father, for those first responders who are working now, that we may be safe as we worship. We pray, Father, for the women and men who wear the uniform of the United States military. We ask your blessings upon them all for their safety, for their return to their families. We ask, dear Lord, today that you pray those, uh, that you protect and lead those who would lead us. We pray for them, that your ear is attentive to their voice, and that their heart is pure enough to do what needs to be done in order to faithfully lead those who they've been appointed or elected to lead. And today, Father, as we do at this hour each week, we ask that you teach us to pray, just as you taught your disciples when you told them to say this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever.
As our ushers come forward this morning, let's take time to pray together once more. Father, you promised abundance. Whatever abundance we need, but the most blessed abundance, abundance you promised to us was an abundance of your presence. We experience that in different ways throughout the story of the Bible, but now, in this time, we experience the abundance of your presence through the power of the Holy Spirit. It lives within the hearts of believers, and it comes to bear through what we do in your name in this place. We thank you, Father, that you loved us enough to do exactly what Jesus promised, to send your presence into this world. And now we work, Father, to share your blessings with the rest of the world. We do this in many ways. We do this, Father, through giving so freely of our time, of our talent, of the blessings that you pour out upon us. And now as we worship you, through giving back just a portion of that which you've shared with us. We ask your blessings to fall upon both gift and giver and upon this time of worship and giving. We pray, Father, that you multiply both gift and giver and that both would go into the world to serve you, to make your son known, and to spread the gospel that the world might come to know you as we do. We offer this prayer in great faith in and through the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated.
Amen. Beautiful. Would you stand together, please? may be seated. Thank you to the hymn team for a fantastic time in worship this morning. Thank you to you for uh, climbing out of the bed and joining us at this uh, traditional worship, we call it here at Forest Park. And our contemporary worship service starts at 1030. So if you're watching online, you still have time to climb out of your bed and join us for the 1030 worship if you would like to. We'd love to have you at either or both worship services and for one of our small groups or Sunday school classes that meet in between. We are very excited about the offering of small groups that is uh, beginning at our church this coming fall. We're going to be kicking that off here in just a couple of weeks. I think we have a couple of slots left in one of the small groups. Uh, be sure to check if you're interested. Uh, if you're interested, look at the uh, sign-up sheets that are, are across from the restrooms here uh, as you enter into the fellowship hall. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we got your attention one way or the other. Uh, we are delighted to offer small groups and as we start that off we're going to be starting off 40 days of prayer as well and our first offering of small groups we're going to center around those 40 days of prayer so all small groups this first time will be on the same sheet of music so to speak it's funny to me what scares children um, it's not funny to scare children that's not entirely true. <laughs> I'm just going to be perfectly honest. One of my most favorite things to do in the world is to sneak up on someone and give them a little scare. If you don't believe me, just ask the staff here at church. They are often surprised by me. Uh, sometimes politely, sometimes not so politely as I will surprise them. But it's funny to me what gets in the minds of children that is actually frightening to the children. At growing up, I remember and I realized that I'm going to have to qualify this because as I was thinking about and planning my sermon this week, I, I was sad to realize that there's probably an entire generation that's uh, growing up right now that that when I refer to Tarzan they don't know who I'm talking about when I refer to Tarzan they're just not savvy because there hasn't been a Tarzan movie in an awfully long time but Tarzan the ape man he was the wild man who was raised in the jungles of Africa by apes and he finds Jane uh, who is uh, in the jungle with her dad and uh, those that story has been circulating uh, for years and years and years what was it Edgar Rice Burroughs is that that the author of the original Tarzan I, I think that's correct and so he's written this and we've got all the movies both uh, old and modern but the Tarzan that I remember as a kid was uh, played by Johnny Weismuller uh, an Olympic diver uh, and swimmer and of course he's got all the muscles and everything but I remember as a child talking to my friends about watching the Tarzan movie generally they would come on on Saturday afternoons when I was a kid and we uh, to the person were all freaked out get this about quicksand okay quicksand I, I was raised in South Alabama there's no quicksand in South Alabama but we were like I don't know if I should walk around how close should I get to that puddle 
Because if you've ever watched the Tarzan movies, you see people get into quicksand, and the more they struggle, the more stuck they become. And the more stuck they become, the deeper they sink into that mire. And I, I don't, I've never researched quicksand. I'm assuming that it's a real thing in some places. But I remember being so frightened about stepping in something that you could not get out of. And the more you struggled, the deeper you sank until you were finally over your head and you smothered in that muck and mire. Life sometimes feels like that muck and mire. It has an incredible way of grabbing us at the ankles and dragging us down. You heard Penny testify to that earlier. Sometimes life becomes so overwhelming that we feel like we are stuck, we are hopeless, and we can't do anything about it. For the past few weeks, we've been in the midst of a sermon series called Dealing with Feelings. How it is that, that we can tap into our faith and overcome these human feelings that will pull us down, that will seemingly drown us at times, and, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Today we're going to be talking about how it is that we tap into our faith and how we use our faith to get over feeling stuck. When you feel stuck in this life, maybe you even feel like you're sinking down. When you're feeling stuck, how is it that you can tap into your faith? Or how is it that you can tap faith to escape feeling stuck? We're going to meet two men today who were stuck as we turn to the Gospel of Matthew, we're going to read about two men who were hopeless. We're going to read about two men who had nothing else to do but sit back and yell at Jesus himself. If you have your Bibles with you today, turn to the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to be looking at verses 29 through 34. Relatively short story that we're going to be reading today. But one indeed where these two gentlemen find themselves stuck. Matthew chapter 20, verses 29 through 34. Feeling stuck? Let's see what these two gentlemen did as Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho. A large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Well, the crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet, but they shouted all the louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called them, what do you want me to do for you, he asked. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. And Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately, they received their sight and followed him. An amazing story for a number of reasons. Jesus was reaching the end of his ministry here on earth. And in Jericho, he was headed out. And up to Jerusalem, it's amazing that if you, if you look at a map, when, when you hear Scripture say they were going up to Jerusalem, what you'll find out is when you, you, especially if you look at a topographical map, when Scripture says they were going up to Jerusalem, that's literally what it means. They were moving from one elevation to another. Jerusalem was generally higher up than most places. So when it says they were going up to Jerusalem, it's not just a uh, uh, saying in Scripture, it's a truth, both literally and physically. Jesus and his disciples were going up to Jerusalem from Jericho. And Jesus was about to end his ministry in his sacrifice on the cross. And here we have two men that cry out to him in desperation, looking for, hoping for, wanting to be unstuck. They had one thing to rely on, and that was their faith. They had one thing to fall back on, one card that had not been played, to demonstrate their faith to Jesus himself. And they did. 
and it pays off. For me and for you, sometimes it's very difficult to cry out in desperation. Oh, sure, if Jesus himself were walking by, we wouldn't have any problem crying out in desperation. How many of you here um, have been watching The Chosen? Have you seen The Chosen and been watching The Chosen? Um, I've watched some of the episodes. I haven't watched them all. But on my Facebook feed, on my YouTube feed, sometimes they will show clips. And I have to tell you, if you have not seen The Chosen, and you want to be touched, you want to be moved, simply Google The Chosen, and the woman who touches the hem of Jesus' garment. Watch that story that you've heard time and time and time again played out well right in your face. That's moving. This woman pushes through the crowd in faith knowing, I don't have to touch him. I don't want to make him unclean. But if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I can be healed. It's that same desperation, that same faith that these two men are drawing on because they feel stuck. She felt stuck. One thing that this story shows us is it doesn't matter how desperate things get in your life. God never stops being God. And we're going to talk about that in just a few moments. But as we talk about tapping into our faith, Tapping into our faith to overcome that overwhelming human feeling of being stuck. Some things that popped out to me as I was studying for the sermon are this. First, faith makes room for recognition and confession. When you tap into your faith, faith is going to make room for recognition and confession. And that is displayed in the scripture that we just read by the blind men who acknowledge Jesus in a not so unique for the time, but a very special way that bears pointing out. The two blind men were sitting there, it says in verse 30, by the roadside when they heard that Jesus was going by. And they shouted, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. There is um, there's power in that recognition. There's power in that confession. There is confession. Lord. Lord. There's confession that this is not a regular person. And then there is recognition in who this is. Lord, son of David. That's striking, particularly because of the scripture that Michael shared with us this morning from Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied exactly what was about to happen to these men and others with the coming of the Messiah. Isaiah prophesied that there would be a day coming when God himself would intervene in the life of his people and display his power within a window so that time would change, that there would be a shift in the understanding, in the thinking about who God is and how he interacts with his people. So there is recognition. There is confession, if you will. These men confess that they believe that this person is Lord. They recognize, even in their blindness, that this man is the man who all Jews believe was going to come in the lineage of David. They're acknowledging in their faith that he is the Messiah. Not that he is one prophesying of the Messiah's coming. Not that he's simply a prophet. But that he is who Isaiah said he was. He is the fulfillment of everything that they had ever heard and known about Messiah. There's power in confession. There's power in recognition. And if you're feeling stuck, if you're feeling hopeless, the best place to start digging yourself out of that quicksand is to simply stop and acknowledge God for who He is. Look, God, I've done everything I can. I don't know what else to do. 
But I'm calling on you, not because I'm at my wit's end, but because I believe you are who your word says you are. I have experienced in my past my faith come to bear in such a way that there's no other explanation than you are who you say you are. You are Lord, you are Messiah, you are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That ability for faith to allow you to tap in and make that confession again or make that confession for the first time, especially when you are stuck, is extremely powerful. It is bowing on the knees of your heart, if you will. It is yielding everything that you know empirically in your mind, conceptually in your mind, yielding that and allowing that faith to bridge the gap between what you know and who God is. That's the battle of the world, folks. The battle of the world is allowing something to bridge the gap between what you know, what you see, what you can feel, and the truth of who God is. There's a huge gap there for most of us. And the only thing that bridges that gap is faith. What bridges the gap between science and faith, or science and God? Faith. That's what bridges that gap. That bridge begins to be built when you confess and you acknowledge the truth of who God is. When you feel stuck, make sure that you grab that vine, so to speak, talking about Tarzan as we were earlier, you grab that vine that's going to allow you to recognize and confess the truth about who God is. Faith makes room for recognition. Faith makes room for confession. Faith makes room for supplication. Faith makes room for supplication. What do I mean there? Well, in a couple of weeks, we're going to begin to talk about prayer and talk about specifically spiritual growth. But one of the things that you will see when we begin to talk about prayer is this idea that there is a, a part of prayer that is known as supplication. Supplication is when you bear your heart to God and share with Him what it is that you need. You can do that on behalf of others, but you can do that on your behalf as well. We see these two blind men state simply to God in the person of Jesus Christ by saying, we want our sight. We want our sight. It's that simple. God will yearn to know what it is that you need in your heart and life. He understands it. He conceptualizes it and he conceptualizes it and he knows it before you ask him, but he loves to hear you say it. Now, it's not some formula that you can use, it's not some lamp for you to rub and experience a genie. It is a way, though, for you to verbalize what it is that you need, what it is that you desire. And a way for God to concretely fulfill that desire so that your faith is built. And friends, let me share something with you that's very important here. Your faith is built so that your faith can grow. But your faith grows primarily so that you can share it. Okay? Your faith grows primarily so that you can share it with the rest of the world. What do I say to you about salvation so often? For years, the modern church, I'm talking modern as in 1950s, 1960s, modern as a time period. Now we're in the postmodern area, progressing into whatever it's going to be next. Modern, postmodern. The modern church for years told us that we need to get saved so that we can go to heaven. You need to have faith so that you can go to heaven. 
Friends, I tell you repeatedly because this is important for us to uh, encapsulate into our mind and, and hold within our heart. Getting to go to heaven is not the purpose of our salvation. Getting to go to heaven is the byproduct of our salvation. The purpose of our salvation is so that we can spread the gospel. The purpose of our salvation is so that we can be put right with God, understand Him in such a way that allows us to build faith and share that faith with the rest of the world. We hold that faith until we die, then we open our eyes in heaven, and the byproduct of our salvation is that, that we are restored, that our faith becomes sight, that we see Jesus as He is. That's the byproduct, the purpose is so that we, through our own faith, can bolster and share the faith with others. It's wonderful when we're able to do that. It starts with supplication. God, this is what I need. God, this is what I want. This is what I desire. Be prepared for him to say no. Be doubly prepared for him to say nothing. Sometimes, time is of the essence. And sometimes, in this act of supplication, God says nothing. Because His time is different than your time and my time. Does not change who He is. Does not change who we are. It does not mean that He does not hear. It does not mean that he does not care. God's promise to you, God's promise to me, God's promise to all believers in the Word, time and time and time again, is not that we will get whatever we ask, but that he will be with us in those trials that are causing us to ask in the first place. What about when Jesus says, ask whatever you want in my Father's name and he will give it to you. There's a matter of alignment there. And sometimes silence or a no from God is exactly what you need even though it may not be exactly what you want. Supplication is a very important part of tapping into your faith that allows you to overcome that feeling of being stuck. You see, it's not the fact that you are stuck. It's the way being stuck makes you feel that makes all the difference. Being stuck is one thing. Losing hope because you are stuck is another thing. It is losing hope when you are stuck that will silence your supplication. It is losing hope when you are sinking that will close your mouth and crush your heart. It's not God's desire. God's desire is to know. And faith in Him allows us to cry out to Him and ask him for exactly what it is that we need. I love this. Jesus stopped and called to them. What do you want me to do for you? We want our sight, they said. Jesus had compassion on them. He, he touched their eyes. Immediately, they received their sight. Faith makes room for recognition and confession. Faith makes room for supplication. And I think probably one of the most astounding things that faith does for us when we feel stuck is that faith transcends proximity. Faith transcends proximity. Jesus 
had compassion on them and he touched their eyes. What do I mean when I say that faith transcends proximity? Faith transcends proximity in a number of ways, but chiefly by crushing societal norms. Faith in God and the gospel crushes societal norms. There's a reason that people were yelling at these two blind men to be quiet. Chief, they were sick of hearing from the blind men. Because the blind men were blind. Obviously, they were blind because somebody in their past, or even them, was a massive sinner. So society is already looking down their nose at them. They're tired of hearing from them because they or someone in their life was obviously a sinner. Because all they ever do is sit there and wail. And this is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. This is the Messiah. And you're going to sit there and you're going to scream at him. Faith. Faith helps you get unstuck when it begins to crush societal norms. Notice there's one person in all of that who hears and who acts in a way that is merciful. And it's the person you would expect. It is Jesus himself. Jesus hears them. And the gospel in person crushes those societal norms, recognizes them, asks them what they want, and then gives it to them by touching them. That's amazing. The only other time that I am more moved by Scripture when it acknowledges that Jesus touches someone is when Jesus reaches out and touches the leper. Because in that moment, in that moment, he makes himself ceremonially unclean and crushes societal norm. There's nothing, nothing at all about the gospel that makes sense to the world. Nothing. That's why the world looks at us with crooked eyes when we say that we follow Jesus. Because there's nothing about the gospel that makes sense to the world. Faith transcends proximity by crushing societal norms. The crowd rebukes these men who are stuck and Jesus acts regardless of what society demands. Faith transcends proximity also by allowing a realization that our God can be personal and God. You see that's another aspect of Jesus yielding and touching these men. It helps us to understand that faith allows God to be exactly what he needs to be. And for you and for me, and according to his will, he desires to be personal and still maintain his deity. This is the God that we serve. And this is the God we lean into when we're feeling stuck. A God who is big enough to be both. A God who is big enough to maintain his throne and stand, sit, cry, kneel, weep, rejoice with us. Not above us, but beside us. This is the God that we worship. This is the God of the gospel. This is the God who says, faith in me will either move you from being stuck or sit beside you in the dirt while you are stuck or both. And I'm not going to give anything up. A God who is personal and a God who is God at the same time is a God who inspires faith and a God who can move you from feeling stuck. Reach out and in a very personal way, lift you out of that muck and mire. Maybe, maybe physically, but certainly spiritually. 
lift you out of that muck and mire, and help you understand that healing and hope is literally just a breath away at times. It's what we do with our faith that matters. Are you stuck? Do you feel stuck? And is feeling stuck getting the better of your faith? Or are you drawing a bead on feeling stuck with your faith? There's a massive difference. And it's not always easy. Using your faith to lift you up out of that feeling. That human feeling. That feeling that is imperfect. But oh so powerful. Using faith to lift you up out of that feeling is tantamount into not only growing your faith, but giving you the ability to faithfully and truthfully share that faith with others. Tap into it. Overcome what you feel and cling to what you know in that God who is personal and still, still God. Pray with me. God, help us to do this, for it is not always easy. Sometimes, sometimes feeling stuck not just grabs on to us, but sometimes feeling stuck sets the hook, so to speak, in our flesh and refuses to let go. It is almost, at times, a palpable pulling it is at times seemingly pointless it is at times frustrating especially when we do confess and acknowledge and especially when we do what your word says and remain stuck. But let us never forget that even when that happens, your office does not change, nor does your proximity. For you are always God and you are always with us, even when we are stuck. Oh, Father God, let that always be on our heart and in our mind and let us always reach out for you for your word says when we seek you you will be found let us not equate what the world would claim to be a, a magical healing or a magical transformation. Let us never devalue the gospel enough to equate that with a God who is God and a God who is personal. For you are so much more, so much more than what this world demands from you. Let us hold on to the truth of who you are to us through faith. And let us do our best to lean into you and not into our human feeling of being stuck. Let us do this with hope, with faith, and with trust. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen. I invite you to stand with us. We're going to close out service this morning in song. The altar is open. If you need to come forward and pray, please feel free to do so. Stand together as we close in song.
Thank you so much for joining us today and receive this benediction as you depart. Go now into the world uh, despite how you feel and allow the truth of who God is to well up in your heart and spill into the world in a way that testifies to the truth. Not of how you feel, but of who he is. Don't fear because you do not do this alone. You do this with the love of God, with the peace of Christ, and with the power of the Holy Spirit moving you forward. In his name and for his glory, amen. Thank you for coming.